Teachers, hi! My name is Sarah Smith. Welcome to Lead to Teach and we're engaged. Are you so excited? I think about in real life when you tell people that you're engaged, typically their response is one of excitement. And why is that? Isn't it because you're indicating by your engagement that you're willing to commit to this person for life, right? And that's an exciting idea. And I think about in the classroom, when we say that students are engaged, what we mean is that they are committed to learning. They're participating in the content. Because of that, we know that we're going to see academic and behavioral and social outcomes that are really favorable. And that is cause for excitement. So I am super excited <laughs> about today's session. As always, guided notes are at leadtoteach.com, but I'm hoping we can recall just a couple of things first. Effective teachers are, are effective because they maximize their structure. They're incredibly organized, right? They clarify their expectations. They reinforce when students meet those expectations, but they also respond to disruptions. And then the topic for today, they engage their students. And I love this final piece of the puzzle for classroom management because it's the piece that begins to bridge the gap toward good instruction. All of these previous four items are necessary for good classroom management, but we have to have engagement if we also want to have good instruction. So I'm excited we finally get to move into the piece that talks about what does good instruction look like as well as good classroom management. Okay, so let's start by defining what engagement is. Academically, engagement is a strategy that invites all students to participate during instruction. So just like a school of fish move together through the ocean, we're saying we want our students to move together through this ocean of content. We don't just want them to arrive at the target sporadically and on their terms because some of them may never get there. We want to move them as a group toward our academic content or target. So another way of saying that is everyone in the class will say it. Everyone will respond vocally. Everyone will show it. Everyone will demonstrate understanding through some sort of gesture and everyone will write it. There's no such thing as one person raising their hand. The key word here is everyone. Everyone will say it, show it, write it. Okay, so I saw an example of this earlier this week where a teacher was introducing contractions to her first grade class and she was introducing the word it's, short for it is, and she said to the students, this is called an apostrophe. Say apostrophe three times, ready? Apostrophe, apostrophe, apostrophe. And what was really interesting about that is when she did that, I happened to be standing next to a little boy who doesn't speak English as a first language. And I noticed that the first time he said apostrophe, and the second time he said apostrophe, and the third time he said it really confidently, apostrophe. And by having her kids all say that word together, she ensured that they were all going to learn about apostrophes with her. So today what we want to talk about is how to use verbal engagement strategies, or in other words, choral responding. Okay, can we talk about the why behind choral responding? <laughs> this is kind of personal for me because when my daughter was in elementary school, I remember at one point she began doing really poorly in math and I was so surprised because she had always been a strong student and I had opportunity to be in her classroom later that year acting as a coach and not as a parent. And what I saw was that the teacher had classroom sticks, right? Every student had a stick. And throughout the lesson, she would just call sticks uh, one at a time. And she would just say, so this is an example of what, Lizzie? And Lizzie would say, uh, the commutative property of addition? Yep, you got it, Lizzie. Good job. I'm so glad everyone knew that. And she would give credit for everyone knowing the answer that Lizzie knew. If she happened to draw a stick where someone didn't know the answer, she would just draw another stick. And afterwards, we talked about this idea of, you know, research indicates that everyone should do everything. That if you want the kids to learn about the commutative property of addition, then they all need to say that terminology. And her response was, yeah, but by the way I draw my sticks, by the way I just do it so rapid fire, I really keep them on their toes because they never know whose stick is going to be drawn next. And in a class of 28 kids, <laughs> we ended up calculating, even if you're drawing seven sticks a minute, kids are having a chance to respond once every four minutes. And hopefully they get the answer right because if not, you're just drawing a new stick. So that teacher did end up shifting her practice, but it was really eye-opening to me to understand why 
my daughter had begun to fail math that year and it was because she wasn't doing everything during the lesson. There was no accountability for the group at large. It was only four single students whose stick happened to have been drawn. So let's talk about the research, can we? What does research tell us about student engagement strategies? Well, the positive effects of OTRs, which is another way of saying opportunities to respond, the positive effects of OTRs include decreases in, ready? Disruptive behavior, we're not surprised, and increases in on-task behavior, academic engagement, participating during the lesson, and number of correct responses. So I get a decrease that's favorable and an increase that's favorable when I use engagement strategies. And this can even be true for students with EBD or emotional and behavioral disorder. Uh, in one study, they found a little girl who had really severe EBD uh, showed a reduction in disruptions from two disruptions per minute in the severe category to one every four minutes. Wow, all of a sudden that starts to feel manageable, doesn't it? On-task behavior for this little girl increased by 33%. She was 33% more likely to be on task when the teacher was require requiring that everybody respond. Correct responses increased from 0 0.025 to 0 0.90 during the course of every lesson. I mean, that's pretty compelling, isn't it? That even our students who struggle the most behaviorally can benefit from this sort of strategy. So the idea is not, who can raise their hand and tell me blank? Raise your hand if you know. I'll call on someone to tell us about because the flaw in each of these is that I'm only requiring single student participation. Well, strike one, if that's the approach the teacher takes, is that we're really saying, okay, one of you will participate while 99 do not. In other words, I'm only requiring single student participation because I can only guarantee that the student whose stick I've drawn is the one participating. And that's going to create a lot of downtime. And we've talked a lot about how excessive downtime inevitably, invariably leads to disruption, right? High levels of off-task noise and movement. So that's strike one. One of you participate, 99 do not. We're not gonna be that old school anymore. <laughs> Strike two is that when we only allow single students to respond, we strengthen the understanding of those who already know the most about the idea. Um, you've heard the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. That is absolutely true in single student participation versus whole group engagement strategies. In other words, we, we may be inadvertently, but still end up widening that knowledge gap. Those who already know that this little floating comma in the air is called an apostrophe can tell me that and strengthen their understanding of it, while those who never knew that don't have a chance to say it and begin to understand it. Strike three, even though strikes one and two were enough for me, I, it was out on strike one. <laughs> strike three with single student participation is that we as the teacher end up saying, I hope that you as the student in this group Explain your idea loudly and clearly and accurately enough that everyone else understands and learns the content. I, I hope that you can do those three things in order to teach what everybody else in this room needs to know. Um, so the strike there is that there's a pedagogy deficit, right? Students may know that this is called an apostrophe. They may be very good at the commutative property of addition, but if they can't explain it loudly, clearly, and accurately enough to bring the rest of the group along with them, and I would guess that they can't because they haven't had instruction in how to instruct, then we've got a pedagogy deficit. So what we're doing instead is everyone say this word with me. Everyone echo my turn first. I'll ask and everyone will answer, right? Everyone will do everything. Here's win one when we do this sort of approach. All of you will participate during instruction. In other words, all of you are accountable, right? I have high accountability when everybody is required to say this terminology with me. Uh, who loves Downton Abbey as much as I do? I don't know if it's the dresses. I don't know if it's the accents. I don't know if it's the plot line. <laughs> but what is not to love about Downton Abbey? The idea here would be then that nobody sits out during dinner, right? There's nobody that's excluded from this conversation or from this task or event or activity, everybody is invited to sit down at the table and participate and be accountable jointly. Win number two, when we invite everyone to respond, is that those who already quote unquote get it, right, your strong kids, 
have a chance to express it, while those who are just learning the content, who maybe didn't know it coming into this, can start to vocalize it. What? This is, in my opinion, the easiest, easiest way to differentiate instruction. Whenever I hear teachers say, I just really feel like I need to differentiate and meet the needs of my high kids, but then, oh, how do I bring my low kids along too? The first and simplest and most impactful answer is engagement because we both have a role, right? If you already know it, your job is to help me say it. If you don't know it, your job is to get on board and begin to say it. <laughs> Either way, you're going to win. Okay, then number three, the third benefit of everybody responding is that as the most trained person in the classroom, you as the teacher can teach this idea loudly and clearly and accurately enough that everyone can understand and learn the content. I'm no longer relying on one kid in that sea of, of fish to say it loudly, clearly, accurately enough that everybody else follows along. No, I as the most trained and qualified person in the classroom, I'm going to take responsibility for that. Anita Archer would call it explicit instruction. There's lots of research about just that topic on its own, but in a nutshell, that's what we're looking at. Okay, so if we're bought into this idea that yes, Engagement is an effective strategy, and on us, how then do we do it? What should it look like? Um, I wanna show you this video uh, where I'm hoping you can just tally how many times all the students are invited to chorally respond. So this is a first grade classroom, and the kids are going to learn what's called the doubling rule. And, and it's a spelling rule, it's a phonics lesson. Would you just tally how many times all students are invited to respond? And just a quick note, if they say something three times, like consonant, 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 you could just tally that as one response. But how many times are all kids invited to respond in this three and a half minute video? In order for you to be really, really good at our new spelling rule today, you have to know the vowels, which are A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. Good, if you have your sign language, will you try it with me? The vowels are A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. You got it. If you're good at those vowels, you should be good at today's spelling lesson. Of course, we know that the rest are not vowels. They are c c consonants. They're consonants. So let's look at what we're doing today. A couple of nights ago, my daughter Isabel was reading a book, and she saw in the book the word sitting. Read it with me, sitting. sitting. And she brought it to me and she said, Mom, I'm kind of confused about this word. And I said, why? And she goes, because if you cover up ing, sit is spelled S-I-T-T. -T. But I'm pretty sure T is not a floss letter because the floss letters are F-F-L-L-S-S. You knew it. She said, those are the floss letters are F-F-L-L-S-S-T-T. -T. Why is there a T-T? -T? And I told her, oh, Isabel, it's a new rule called the doubling rule. Will you say it? The, the doubling, doubling rule. rule. We're going to learn today something called the doubling rule. Cole, I'm in love with your arms. Thanks, dude. Being a great example. So here's how the doubling rule works. The first thing I have to look at is the root word. The first thing you look at is the root word. Good listening. I look at the root word and I say, does my root word end in a vowel and then a consonant? Ethan, you're kind of not, some kids already nodding. Is O a vowel? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is P a consonant? Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to give it a check. Ooh, some kids knew it. Give it a check. check. Now I look at suffix t, t, ed. Is ed a vowel suffix? Just show me thumbs up or down. Just show me by your, under your chin so other kids don't take your answer. Okay, all my kids are saying thumbs up. Ed is a vowel suffix, so I give it a check. check. You got it. Now what I do is I'm going to spell the word a little differently. Shop plus t is going to equal shopped. Some kids knew it. But I want you just to watch how I'm going to spell this differently. Raise your hand when you see what letter I change. Not yet, because I haven't started. But raise your hand when you see when I spell it, what letter I change. Shopped is going to be spelled S-H-O-P-P. -P. Good watching. E-D. 
And the letter I changed was the letter P. P, the letter P is the letter I changed. Because you might notice over here, I only had one letter P. But over here, Connor, your eyes are up here. I had two letter P's. Somebody said it. Over here, I had two letter P's. You got it. I doubled the consonant. Say it with me. I doubled the consonant. You got it. Okay. So depending on how you counted, your numbers might fluctuate a little bit, but it's somewhere between 12 and 16, right? If you're in this ballpark, then you're in the right ballpark. <laughs> that all students were invited to chorally respond versus one student raising his or her hand to give an answer. Um, here's what's happening behind the scenes. So I wanted to just show you that to give you a frame of reference. Behind the scenes, here's what I'm thinking as a teacher. Uh, first of all, when are they going to respond? And it's really quite simple. There's two times that kids are going to need to respond. And that is if I, as a teacher, am talking about an idea that is new or key. If it's something new that they haven't heard before, they absolutely need to be saying it. Or if it's key to their understanding, they have to know this part in order to understand the content, then they absolutely need to be saying it. They need to be vocalizing during the lesson. So in this lesson 111, the doubling rule, it was important that they say the word vowels. Maybe that's not new, but it is key to understanding the content in this lesson. It's important that they say the word consonants, not new, but key. The doubling rule, that is new. So absolutely, they should be saying that term. Root word, that's just key. Check, that's just key, right? When we're saying we make a check because that's how we initially uh, see if a word qualifies for the doubling rule. Two letter P's, that's just key. And double the consonant, that was new. So everything on this page is an idea of something that is either new to their understanding or key to their understanding. And that's how I'm gauging whether they need to say it with me. Uh, how do they know that they are supposed to respond? This is probably the most important part <laughs> is that you as the teacher have to give a clear signal. Have you ever had this experience where you're driving and somebody puts their blinker on, but, but they put it on way too soon and you think they're about to turn. So you kind of slow down and then the blinker just stays on and on and on and on. And pretty soon you get frustrated. Like, what are you doing? Are you turning or not? And you want, if you're like me, you want to honk <laughs> and you wish that you could say to them, like, put your blinker on when you mean to, or something, you know, inappropriate like that. But at the opposite end of the spectrum is sometimes people don't use a blinker, right? And they just all of a sudden turn and you're left having the same response. Like, put your blinker on when you're supposed to, right? Because it's confusing for the drivers behind that person if the blinker, if the signal is not used correctly and clearly. So the same holds true in our classroom that we want to give clear signals to respond. Here's a couple of my favorites that are vocal. I might say, everybody say apostrophe, ready? Or I might say, Echo, the word is apostrophe, echo, apostrophe. Or I could just use the words, say it. This word is apostrophe, say it, apostrophe. So regardless of which one I'm choosing, do you notice that effective cues are, here's our rule of thumb, short, sweet, and to the point. <laughs> and the reason I have a picture of this darling golden retriever is because I was, uh, I was, out and about the other day and my daughter and I happened to see a guy who was uh, throwing a ball for his golden retriever on this giant patch of lawn and what happened is is before the ball was even out of this guy's hand the dog was running <laughs> the dog was ready to go get that ball and just was bounding across this lawn and retrieving the ball and bringing it back and ready to go again and again and again and it occurred to me as I watched this now you guys know like how much I think about teaching. <laughs> this is a lot like engagement. Like kids are just so eager to respond. It doesn't matter if they know the content or they don't know the content, right? Your advanced kids or your struggling kids, they are so eager to say a response. They're so eager to vocalize and to use oral language. So you don't have to do anything really lengthy and elaborate to get them to respond. It can be as simple as ready, echo, say it, and they are ready to say it with you. They want to say it with you. Um, let me say one quick word about working memory. I'm going to tell you a number and here's your challenge. Ready? Can you keep this number 
in your brain without writing it down, without, <laughs> without any sort of visual prompting or cueing. Okay, here's the number is 7704179. Okay, I want you just to keep that memory or keep that number in your working memory for just uh, maybe the next 10 seconds as we talk about how important it is that you don't have too lengthy of cues because when you have cues that are too lengthy, what ends up happening is the words that you are saying actually uh, become a barrier to the kids being able to repeat the words back to you because you've said too many words between what you wanted them to say and the cue to say it, and now they've lost that sequence of words from working memory. Uh, so to drive the point home, can you still remember that number that I told you 10, 15, 20 seconds ago? And if you're like most adults, the answer is probably no. Okay, it was 7704179. Did you remember it? Most people would say, no, of course I didn't remember it. You were talking too much in between and I didn't have a chance to write it down. So how would you expect me to remember that? Yeah, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't expect you to remember that. But the same is true for our kids. Effective cues are short, sweet, and to the point, not only because kids want to get to it and want to use that oral language and responding ability, but because if we interrupt with too lengthy of cues, they've lost the sequence of words from working memory. Okay. So effective cues are short, sweet, and to the point. I started to say effective teachers are short, sweet, and to the point. <laughs> I guess I guess that could be true too. But in other words, teachers use minimal wording to invite responding. I'm going to use the shortest cue that I can to invite you to give me a response. So here are some of my favorite non-vocal cues. In other words, I'm not using my voice to in invite responding. Uh, one is just fill in the blank. One is raised pitch. I'm raising my voice to invite a response. And the kids learn by that raised pitch that they're supposed to say something back. And one is pointing, uh, which is especially useful for like a list of words. This word is fill, fill, raised, pointing, pointing, right? And all I'm doing is pointing when you're supposed to respond. So these I think are going to be a little bit vague until you see an example. So let's jump to an example. In this video, inviting this, this same first grade group to respond, it's the exact same three and a half minute clip. The only thing I'm hoping you'll notice this time is what is done in order to indicate that students should respond. So same video, but this time we're not looking for when they respond, right? Newer key ideas. This time we're looking for what indicates that they should respond. What are those cues? Um, the hint is that there's lots of fill in the blank and raised pitch. So notice that as you watch this clip again. In order for you to be really, really good at our new spelling rule today, you have to know the vowels, which are A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. Good. If you have your sign language, will you try it with me? The vowels are A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. You got it. If you're good at those vowels, you should be good at today's spelling lesson. Of course, we know that the rest are not vowels. They are c c consonants. They're consonants. So let's look at what we're doing today. A couple of nights ago, my daughter Isabel was reading a book and she saw in the book the word sitting. Read it with me. Sitting. sitting. And she brought it to me and she said, Mom, I'm kind of confused about this word. And I said, why? And she goes, because if you cover up ing, Sit is spelled S-I-T-T, -T, but I'm pretty sure T is not a floss letter because the floss letters are F-F-L-L-S-S. -S -S. You know it. She said those are the floss letters are F-F-L-L-S-S-T-T. -T. Why is there a T-T? -T? And I told her, oh, Isabel, it's a new rule called the doubling rule. Will you say it? The, the doubling, doubling rule. rule. We're going to learn today something called the doubling rule. Cole, I'm in love with your arms. Thanks, dude. Being a great example. So here's how the doubling rule works. The first thing I have to look at is the root word. The first thing you look at is the root word. Good listening. I look at the root word and I say, does my root word end in a vowel and then a consonant? Ethan, you're kind of not, some kids already nodding. Is O a vowel? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is P a consonant? Yeah, so I'm going to give it a check. Ooh, some kids knew it. Give it a check. check. Now I look at suffix t, t, ed. 
is ed a vowel suffix? Just show me thumbs up or down. Just show me by your, under your chin so other kids don't take your answer. Okay, all my kids are saying thumbs up. ed is a vowel suffix, so I give it a check. check. You got it. Now what I do is I'm going to spell the word a little differently. Shop plus t is going to equal shopped. Some kids knew it. But I want you just to watch how I'm going to spell this differently. Raise your hand when you see what letter I change. Not yet, because I haven't started. But raise your hand when you see when I spell it, what letter I change. Shopped is going to be spelled S-H-O-P-P. -P. Good watching. E-D. And the letter I changed was the letter P. P, the letter P is the letter I changed. Because you might notice over here, I only had one letter P. But over here, Connor, your eyes are up here. I had two letter P's. Somebody said it. Over here, I had two letter P's. You got it. I doubled the consonant. Say it with me. I doubled the consonant. You got it. Okay. Uh, so did you notice what was done to indicate responding? One was, read it with me, sitting. Will you say it? The doubling rule. Another was, say it with me, I doubled the consonant. So very often, I mean, of all three of these, my favorite is probably that I say a sentence and they repeat it exactly back to me. And how do they know they're supposed to repeat it? Because of that raised pitch. How do they know they're supposed to repeat it? Because of that raised pitch, right? So I've just kept that exact same sentence and invited them to fill in the really key part of that by my raised pitch. And, and then it's still in working memory because I'm just saying the exact same thing I said a second ago. Win-win. Okay, so three examples, and I'm hoping that you can notice echoing of newer key ideas and clear signals to respond. So here's the first one. Example one that you could use, for instance, in a phonics lesson. Okay, first graders, today we're going to learn a new sound. Echo me and listen for which sound is the same at the end of these words. My turn first. Pick, luck, stack. Okay, so that was just pointing to indicate responding. Which sound did you hear the same at the end of pick, luck, stack? Three times it was and I, I use that raised pitch again three times it was, and then cueing with fingers to indicate, tell me three times what that sound was. There are two letters making the k sound. They are, and I'm going to use pitch this time too because my guess is that as I point, the kids will know that. So I want to invite them to say it with me as I tell them the two letters making the k sound. There are two letters making the k sound. They are C, K, C, K, C, K, you got it. C and K, we're saying K. C and K together, when we see C and K together like this, make something called a digraph. When you say digraph, they make a digraph. You got it. And a digraph, and maybe I use my fingers for this, a digraph is two letters that come together and make one sound. That was a lot. Can you say it? Starting a digraph is? A digraph is two letters that come together and make one sound. And that was a lot for them to be able to echo, but I'm using hand gestures and I'm doing it slowly and I'm still mouthing it with them in a really exaggerated fashion so that they can stay with me. Um, so for instance, if I did this for CK as a digraph, I would go C, K, K. Can you do it? C, K, and I'm a huge fan of every time kids are echoing, I'm still moving my lips too, especially for my English language learners or for kids with special needs, kids with auto processing disorders. It's really helpful for them to continue to have that visual cue and not just the auditory one to echo. Okay, uh, here's a quick tip. Beware the open-ended multi-word response invitation. <laughs> um, I heard this in a kindergarten classroom recently where the teacher said to the students, Kinders, today we are going to learn about consonant letter G. Say that. <laughs> and can you just guess what the responses were? Some kids said G. Some kids said letter G. Some kids even said 
we are going to learn about the <laughs> and started to say the whole sequence. And it was kind of a popcorn mess is what it sounded like. Um, the only time we want to invite kids to repeat multi-word answers is if we're having them echo in chunks. So instead of saying, we are learning about the consonant letter G, say that. It might sound something more like, my turn first. We are learning about, we are learning about the consonant letter G, the consonant letter G, right? If you want a multi-word response, it would probably need to be chunked like that, uh, which is maybe what I could have done for digraph just a minute ago now that I like think about that. <laughs> okay, example number two, let's do a math example, ready? Uh, I might say to a group of kids, say second grade, today I want you to learn an idea called place value. And place value may not be new to them, but it's definitely going to be key. So of course we're inviting a response, right? Today I want you to learn an idea called place value. We say it, place value. You got it. Place value means that where I put a number changes how many it is. So up here I have my place value chart and it has three columns. My turn first. Hundreds, hundreds, tens, tens, ones, ones. You got it. So for instance, if I put a three in the hundreds column, what it means is that I have three groups of a hundred. What it means is that I have three groups of 100. You got it. So I would count it like this. 100, 200, 300. Do it. 100, 200, 300. And I'm confident that just that short cue of do it is going to be enough to get them all responding. Why? Because kids are golden retrievers. They want to talk. They want to go. <laughs> if I put a three in the tens place, it means I have three groups of 10. It means I have three groups of 10. You got it. And I count it 10, 20, 30. Do it. 10, 20, 30. However, if I put a three in the ones column, it means I only have three little ones. One, two, three. Can you do it? One, two, three. So where I put the numbers, whether hundreds, tens, or ones, matters because it tells me how many I have of that number. Altogether, this number would be 333. Can you do it? 333. Nice job. So that's what I'm doing as an introduction to our place value lesson. Okay, this next one, here's what I think would be helpful, even though it's going to feel hokey, is to try it on your own first. So, you know, just hit pause, do whatever you need to, to just think about what are the newer key ideas and how am I going to invite student responding? Um, just as an overview, it says we're going to learn the word habitat. Habitat means the place where something lives. For instance, people might live in a house, apartment, or trailer. Sharks live in the ocean, monkeys live in the jungle, and lizards live in the desert. It's called their habitat. So pause it at your own pace and just go through and think, how might you use uh, a concept like habitat to invite responding? And then I'll tell you what I would do. Okay, ready? I would probably say, uh, boys and girls, we're going to learn the word habitat. Hands up, clap with me, and I'm going to say it again because I don't want to interrupt working memory if this is a new idea. We're going to learn the word habitat. Hands up, clap with me the word habitat. Ready? Habitat. Finger tap habitat. Habitat. You got it. Habitat is a three-syllable word that means the place where something lives. Habitat means the place where something lives. You got it. For instance, people might live in a house, an apartment, or a trailer. That's where people could live. And I might just talk for a second to give some understanding to the idea before I start requiring echoing. Sharks live in the ocean. We know that. We know sharks live in the ocean. But monkeys live in the jungle where there's lots of trees. Lizards live in the desert where it's really hot. And there's cactus plants everywhere. No matter where they live, it would be called their habitat. It would be called their habitat. So would you just echo me and let's review some places where people might live. My turn first. People, house, and I'm going to hold my hand out to indicate responding and I'm still going to mouth it with them. So I would say my turn. People, house, people, house, good. Sharks, ocean, sharks, ocean. Monkeys, jungle, monkeys, jungle. Lizards, desert, lizards, desert. You got it. Where they live is called their ha-ha-habitat. Ooh, do it again. Ha-ha-habitat. Ha, 
habitat. You got it. And maybe I give that first consonant as a bounced sound just to get them rolling, get them started with what it is. Okay, did you notice, you probably did, that opportunities to respond can be and should be woven into every subject. It doesn't matter if I'm teaching language arts or math or science or social studies or spelling, <laughs> just part of language arts. No matter what I'm teaching, there's opportunities for kids to respond. Uh, Kevin Feldman calls it miles on the tongue. I love that, I love that. We just wanna put miles on the tongue because the more you talk about this content and these ideas, the more you're going to understand them, the better you're going to begin to perform. Uh, research tells us that during direct instruction, when we are introducing an idea, we want to aim for three opportunities to respond per minute. And, and that's group opportunities to respond, which can include partner talk, but that's a different session. So we're looking for three opportunities to respond per minute during instruction if we want to see impact. Okay, quick review. Ready? Engagement requires at least these three things. Identifying blank or blank ideas. Do you remember what two kinds of ideas we want kids to be talking about? The answer was new or key. Uh, we wanna have clear blanks to repeat those ideas. Do you remember what it was? We wanna have clear signaling to indicate that students should repeat those ideas. And we wanna do it throughout what kinds of subjects? <laughs> Easy, throughout every kind of subject, right? Throughout our day, everyone, We'll do everything. That is just how our class operates. Everyone participates. Everyone is accountable. Everybody is staying engaged. Okay, so final question. What is something you liked or learned about engagement in the classroom? And for me, it's the idea that highly engaged classrooms tend to be the noisiest and the quietest classrooms. Um, and I say the noisiest because there's the most talking, right? But <laughs> what I love about this is that it's academic conversation. It's not conversational chatter, right? When I have a highly engaged classroom, my kids are talking all day long. In fact, they're talking at a rate of about three per minute during instruction and we're doing partner talk. We're constantly participating and responding. And because I give them so many opportunities to talk on my terms, they feel less of a need to talk on their terms by having side conversations, by being noisy during disruptions. So it really is one of these strategies that gets you a reduction in disruption and an increase in academic behavioral social output. Really, really can't say enough good about engagement. Okay, see you next time.